dark tales of rye from Parsons' history. Enclosed within the pages of this book, stayed in fact filled though it seems at first, there lie the puzzle pieces of the lives of children, men, and women who once lived. Figure out patterns for these bare-bone facts. Flesh them in thought as once they were in life, with all their laughter and their tears, and you will come to know this town called Rye as it has been throughout its long years. We live in the town that once was theirs. Its face has changed completely now. Still, memories linger from the past of those who lived here long ago. Well, I think the uh, idea of the poetry that my mother wrote, she started back in the uh, early 80s, and she was writing personal poems, but then, and she would have me come and read these poems. I don't know if she showed them to anybody else, and I loved them. But then all of a sudden I saw her, she was reading Parsons' History of Rye, written in 1905, and she started to write some poems based on some stories that she read in Parsons'. Litany of Rye by the Sea Oh, he was a lover, a husband, a father, a son and a brother, a farmer and a fisherman. He went out bravely, and he was drowned at sea. She was a woman, a loved wife and mother, a sister, a daughter. She and her baby went to visit her family, and they were drowned at sea. Their forebears came here over the ocean, founded their farm sites along Sandy Beach. They came over safely, but others were drowned at sea. The sea gave them sustenance, fish for their hunger, soil enriching weed and a highway to travel. But when it turned stormy, many drowned in the sea. Some went whaling, some privateering, some went traveling, some working cargo. Shore homes held the memory of those lost at sea, drowned in the sea. Drowned. Drowned. This is, to me, is a very spiritual picture. I found this among the family photos, and it's really rough. I love it. It's, it's almost, it's an artistic quality because it's so grainy. I don't quite know what this is in the foreground, but I'm convinced my father took this picture, that, and I'm convinced that that is my mother looking out onto the field where we are today. And I'm guessing that was taken about 1938 before they had done anything to this spread when they bought it in 1937. Star Hitched Wagon. The wagon's special star shone down on it when it was new, built tough and strong with rugged wheels all painted blue. It carried things the farmer wished to move over the ground, rough and smooth. The patient horse drew it around the farmland, filled it with wood or hay or stones. The farm's day passed. The wagon stood beside the barn, quiet at last, as though it waited for the horse's steady pull. An artist came, painted what stood. The picture lives in a barnwood frame, but the wagon sinks each year back to the earth. The wheel rims rust, the paint flakes off, the wood dries rot and turns to dust. The arms of weeds and vines surround it all. When on the grass, formless it lies, bleached by the sun and snow as the seasons pass, its star will shine and draw its dust on high evermore to ride on the winds of eternity. So I've been trying to tell these stories, and, and a few of them, starting back in the, in the uh, 1600s, everybody likes the one about John Locke, who had this private war with the Indians. 
Now, I'm not going to get into a big thing about who had a right to be here first, because, of course, I think the, 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 the Indians felt they could share this land. And, uh, but John Locke had his farm out at Locke's Neck there, and he didn't like the Indians. There was already trouble. Uh, he'd been there since the 1640s, and by the 1680s, it was no love lost between them. So he used to puncture holes in their canoes, and that ticked them off. And one time they said, we're going to nail this guy. So they, he was out there working his, his field, and he had his gun leaned against a tree, and they grabbed his gun and they shot him. In death, not parted. She was young. They wed. He older by seven years, a carpenter. Time stretched ahead. He worked with saw and plane and pounding hammer. Children were bred, nine to be nursed and fed, house chores to do. The years slipped by, happy and sad, some slow, some fleeting fast, fled. All 63 since that day they wed, and then he died. In four days, she, close in one grave they lie, as in their bed. And then you get into the turn of the century and it, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going. The modern age is coming, everything's going too fast. And yet there was mostly, this was a town of farms, agriculture. Dozens and dozens of farms. All you have to do is drive around this town and you see all these old farmhouses. I was raised in one of them. Whether they got a barn or not, it was a farm. And all the food was grown locally, regionally. None of this crap about bringing food in from California the way we do today. It just made so much sense. And I think that's what people are trying to get back to today. Regional, local agriculture. So we don't waste all this energy, so we know where our food came from. Abby Walden. Abby? Abby? Are you here? The boy said we have no ghosts because the graveyard has a wall without an entrance. Solid stones. You are enclosed against your love and built a wall within your mind partitioning off the hard, real world, became deranged and learned to know bleak confines of the asylum walls. At home, you were the strange old maid, shouted at cherry-stealing boys and banged the wooden shutters closed. Which room was yours within this house? Silent, do you come there at night? Or doomed, forever lie alone? No loved man lying at your side, walled in, in death, as when you lived. Behind the walls, ghosts cannot pass. I start with personal history. So everybody's got a personal history, okay, and then you kind of got the group history or the family history, and then you got the, the group of families, the next thing you know, you got a neighborhood, the next thing you know, you got a town. It just sort of flows naturally. But to me, it's a way of getting rooted into the community. I mean, some people do it through sports and, and, and various other things, but what I like about the, 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 the history museum and digging into the town history and trying to write things about it is that it covers everything. It, it's the history of sport, but it's also the history of work. It's the selectmen. It's how people have developed the town, how people have tried to conserve land in the town and keep it from development. It's all of those things. And some of it's quite competitive. Some of it, in fact, involves fighting and involves people with very different views of the land. But to me, it's all history, and it's very much alive. I mean, history matters. Not yet tranquility. Wordsworth said of poetry, it is emotion recollected in tranquility. Is this tranquility? The heart's hammer trips, the eyes are full, the cry stops at the lips after all these years. I hoped, I desired, I begged a sign, a touch upon my hand, your cheek against mine, a warmth upon the pillow, 
but there was no sigh. Are you here? Are you with me? Are you waiting for me? Is this tranquility? Was Annette's touch upon William even when Mary was near? Was his heart in France, far from Grasmere? October always brings you closest. It is our month of memory, not yet of tranquility, but of beginnings and birthdays, of weddings and deaths, of heaven and earth days, of laughter and tears, but not yet of tranquility. Not yet tranquility. There is a way of getting at a history that is very much alive in the present and it can help us move into the future. <laughs>